there are basically seven billion people, and if you've made a big pyramid about who's been undersea the most, in summaries the most, gone the deepest, gone to the most places, has the most unusual stories, at the very top, there's one person, and that's Don. So it's pretty rare that literally one in seven billion people come to talk to you. And something I've noticed about people like that is they tend to be very modest in how they explain their background. So they say things like, we once saw that so-and-so, but they don't mention that's when they were at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, or that's when they were at the Bismarck, or that's when they were picked by two different presidents to advise on science policy, or why, you know, why the State Department goes to them for advice, or why you know, they're the dean of a school of ocean science, things like that. They also don't tend to tell you things about their accomplishments that have been rewarded because they're too modest. My wife tells me I've got a lot to be modest about. Well, there you go. <laughs> but I'll tell you two of them just because they're really impressive to me. One is the United States Navy only likes Navy people. It's very rare for them to say that somebody who's not in the Navy, like in the Marines or the Army, or like a civilian, did something useful. Um, but uh, Don has won the highest possible award from the Navy for civilian service and military service to the Navy. Also, he's won even more impressive to me, personally. He's got the, he won the Hubbard Award from the National Geographic Society, which is what you get when you climb Mount Everest for the first time, or go to the moon, or something like that. In his case, it was going the other direction, climbing down Mount Everest, so to speak, to the bottom of the Mariana's Trench. Because I hope when you listen to him, you'll realize that everything he says represents the integration of all of the world's knowledge on these topics better than anyone else on the planet. Thank you, Don. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you, that was most generous. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Of course, uh, I think it's every kid's dream, even before Google was invented, to visit a place like this because there's, you know, there's so much cerebral popcorn here just walking around and, and uh, it's, it, what a grand place to work. Uh, I, I'm not a very good institutional person, so I can appreciate non-institutional uh, frameworks and so it's really grand to be here. Today uh, I just want to give you a little talk. Now some of you will say well it's just history, telling a nice sea story about where I've been or what we've done, the early exploration in the oceans. But um, I think you folks could really appreciate the notion that um, the whole march of technology and engineering, and that's my basic background engineering, is to move the decimal point. Things that are laboratory curiosities 30 years ago or 10 years ago uh, now become, we have to keep revisiting them because some of them uh, might be possible to transition into operations or marketplace depending on where you're moving. So when I sort of subtitle this, I'll then print it out for you, looking backwards at the future, that's the notion I had in mind. We're going to go back and look at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, manned exploration inside the sea basically taking the trained mind and the trained eye into the environment. And I say personal odyssey, that's a bit precious, I know. But uh, our first hydronaut, if you will, first man of the sea was, was Professor William Beebe, 1930-1934. And I came into this about 59. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, 57. So I've sort of been in this field for two-thirds of its lifetime, personal odyssey. I didn't do all this stuff, but it was a pretty small field. In fact, when um, I had command of the Trieste, uh, the French Navy had an equivalent bathyscaphe. And if we wanted to talk about engineering and technology and operational skills to uh, explore the deep ocean with these manned platforms, we could book a table in a restaurant for about 10 people and they'd all be there. It's kind of bigger now. But that was in the very beginning. We had to write the book. If you wanted something, you had to design it and either build it or have somebody build it. No catalogs or vendors or any of this stuff. So we can see today all of our, our fingerprints on almost everything, underwater manipulators. Our first ROV ever built was for the Trieste. The first underwater manipulator we bought from uh, uh, General, Tom, General uh, Mills, believe it or not. And okay, yes, all the, the uh, O-rings were Cheerios. Uh, but we, uh, uh, all of that stuff, not because we were smart or anything else, but if you wanted it, you had to build it. So that's where I started out. So 
Uh, and I worked with Jacques Cousteau, made some programs with him on Calypso, uh, Hans Haas, a very famous underwater diver of the 50s and 60s, I knew him, and all that. So this was, this was my, my crew as I grew up in this, uh, as a uh, lieutenant in the U.S. Navy coming out of submarines. There's this whole world of these really interesting people at, down at Scripps and throughout the world, and we had what the lawyers call an attractive nuisance. Uh, that's when you don't put a, a, a fence around your swimming pool and a neighbor kid falls in and you get sued and the legal principles, you created an attractive nuisance. So the Trieste in some way was an attractive nuisance. We had, I think the three years I was there, four Nobel laureates come in and have a look at us. For no other reason, they were curious. It was a very yeasty world that we came from. And uh, I'm delighted that for 53, 54 years, I've been able to work in it continuously. So that's a personal odyssey. I probably learned on that button too long. Here's the essential problem. What's down there? How do we see it? And you can see it all right here. That is the, the nature of the question. Because the surface of the ocean is opaque. We can't look into it. I remember, um, and I can't find the damn thing. I want to put it in my, uh, my program. It's a Dennis the Menace uh, cartoon by Hank Ketchum. And it shows Dennis and little Joey standing there uh, looking out at the ocean, the views from behind them. And they're holding hands like this and Dennis saying, yeah, there's a lot more under there. And that's the idea. For you know the, the beginning of oceanographic oceanography is a multidisciplinary science about 1870. That was the Challenger expedition. The Royal Society sent HMS Challenger around the world uh, with scientists. I think it was three-year expedition, two plus, and they uh, they did a heroic amount of collecting. In fact, a lot of the specimens are still being looked at in the 50-volume report from the expedition. But they were at the interface. They lowered artificial hands in the ocean, scooped up stuff, and tried to describe the ocean from crushed bits of sediment or organisms. Uh, they didn't even have artificial eyes, which we had later on in the form of cameras. But why not take the trained mind and the trained eye into the environment? Because that's how we do field sciences. Biology and geology, you go into the field and you observe. As a biologist, you observe the critter that interests you, but also how it interacts with its environment. That's very important. And a geologist has to sort of look at the landform before you take a selected sample out. And the same thing with the biologist. We've never done that in ocean art, but we've done it like this. It's like flying over New Mexico in a balloon on a dark night and lowering down a grapple hook and pulling stuff up and then defining what is down there and that landmass. It's Gila monsters and firemen and maybe an odd uh, VW bug. And then you, you give a learned paper in Monaco about the nature of this new land, Terra, New Mexico. And uh, I, I know it sound, I'm exaggerating. I think you probably gathered that. But the notion of being able to take the trained mind, trained eye in the end of the ocean, very important. Now, if you're a chemist or a physical oceanographer, which is my field, not so important. A chemist can't look at water and decide what it is. You've got to do certain analytical things. But for the observational science, it's very important. Now, that's my parish notices. Let's get on with the program here. OK, I've introduced you to Dr. William Beebe. From 1930 to 34, he made the first voyages into the abyss. 1934, he made a dive to a half mile down. And for those of you that are really keen on sort of history of science and exploration, you can still get a copy of Half Mile Down uh, at uh, an antiquarian bookstore. They're not very expensive because he was a prolific writer. He was kind of this Carl Sagan of his time, a talented scientist, but he, knows, he also knew how to tell a story. In fact, what he was was something that's very rare today, and that's a naturalist. If you look back in the history of science, especially in the late um, 20th century, 19th century, the naturalists were the people that knew something about the plants, the animals, the geology, and they could draw because they didn't have cameras then. And so they were kind of all-purpose people, very useful on expeditions. They could run, pass, and punt. And Beebe was of that world uh, as a trained naturalist. He started out with birds and he did this work in the deep ocean, and at the end of his uh, life, he was working on butterflies. And uh, so he was the ever curious guy, and he could write, and he, his books were very popular. He was very popular on the speaking circuit. He made quite a bit of money, and he bought Nonsuch Island in the Bahamas, and that's where they did this dive, at his island that he bought, he owned. And uh, it was a remarkable thing, half mile down in 1934, when commercial uh, diving, hard hat diving and such, maybe they are getting down to 600 feet by then, but it was very experimental. Half mile down. 
So if you're interested in such things, get the book. You've got his illustrations in there. Don't wait for the movie to come out because that's not going to happen. John Wayne's gone. Uh, so that was William Beebe, uh, a, a giant in our field. The, the, the uh, one thing I'll mention here, and that is the viewports he used were made out of fused quartz, something that uh, General Electric had just developed, you know, as a, as a crystal, uh, and, and made out of that. And we have a gentleman in this room. Where's Chris? There he is. His, his uh, Virgin Oceanic submersible uses a fused quartz dome. The only man to do it in nearly a century. Well done. I'm sure that you know something the rest of us don't know about acrylic. Well, there it is. If you have questions about his sub, you, you'll meet it in my program. You can ask the guy over there in the corner. OK. August Picard was a physicist. He was of the, uh, the crew, if you will, of Einstein, Bohr. Even Madame Curie was still alive when he started out as a physicist. And there's a wonderful picture that was in uh, Jacques Picard's office of a physicist meeting uh, in Lausanne, I think, about 1920, and they're all there. So he was one of the classic family of physicists of around that time. But he was, when he was a student at Zurich Polytechnic in 1904, uh, he was ill for a while, a bed, and he was a balloon pilot in the Swiss Army Reserve. As you know, all males in Switzerland have to belong to the Army Reserve. And he was a balloon pilot, and he was reading these reports of the meteor expedition in the late 1800s, a German expedition all the stuff they were getting by remote sensing, again, sitting on that interface, grabbing stuff up from the depths. And he said, I wonder why you can't use the idea of a balloon to go underwater. They're both fluid media. You just have to have, have something that has payload. You can make it descend, come back up. So that's what you've been looking at here. The one on the left is his Bathy scaff. Bathy meaning deep, scaphos, boat, deep boat. And on the right is the balloon that he was more used to in flying through the air. And, and so he came up with that concept. He didn't do much with it. And it wasn't until 1948, just after World War II, that he developed his first bathyscaphe. FNRS is the French, uh, is the National Research Foundation of Belgium, which had sponsored. FNRS-1, by the way, was a high altitude balloon that Picard set a world's record, 1931, 70,000 feet. The conventional wisdom with medical doctors associated with avi aviation uh, in 1931, is if you went above 24,000 feet, you're sure to die. So nobody would build it, had the capsule, the cabin for his balloon, until he found a brewery in Belgium that would make uh, beer vessels, vats, containers, a huge, like a barrel, okay? It had a few openings in it, things like that. They built it for Professor Picard, sent it to him. That became the cabin for his first balloon. So he, he knew balloons, and he set a world's record. Incident to getting, he, he was studying um, cosmic radiation. So the, the quintessential scientist, it was not to set a record, it was to get it above the uh, masking effect of the Earth's atmosphere so you could get good numbers. He tried the Alps, that didn't work, so he used his balloon. Okay, 1948, builds his first bathyscaphe. Now, uh, we, here we run into the old problem between theory and practice. The theory was pretty good. Uh, it, oops, sorry. I'm mastering this thing now. All right, folks. I push something. Push that again. OK. There it is. Uh, it was, uh, he set it up with a pressure switch because he thought, well, I'll make the first deep dive, deeper dive with it. I'll, uh, I'll have it drop weight and come back uh, automatically. It won't be anybody in it. So it went down to 4,800 feet, came right back up. So there's the theory. It works. Bathyscaphe, good stuff. Here's the cabin. There's the balloon. However, it was unseaworthy. And once it got back on the surface, it started to come apart. So practice, not so good. Uh, and those of you in the front row, if you can see this person right here, this is a French Navy ship that was sent by the Science Foundation to kind of help Picard. And that's uh, Lieutenant Jacques-Yves Cousteau before he went on to other things. Uh, OK, so that was the first bathyscaphe. The foundation said, look, uh, it, it was, your theory is really great, Professor Picard. But we want you to get with the French Navy, go to the French Naval Shipyard in Toulon, where they make submarines, things like that. Keep the bits that are important, that are robust, the cabin, and make a new bathyscaphe that is more seaworthy. And that's what they did. Picards didn't get along with the French very well. They got offers from Italy to build another bathyscaphe. And so here comes the Trieste, 1953. Why is it called Trieste? It was built in the Adriatic Shipyard at uh, near uh, Trieste, Italy. And, uh, 
It was built with all donated goods and services. Pirelli provided the rubber tubing and, and wiring. AGIP, the National Petroleum Company, provided the buoyancy material, which I didn't get to, but this underwater balloon, of course, can't use helium or hydrogen for buoyancy. That don't work underwater. So uh, oil floats on water. Why not fill it with petroleum? Uh, aviation gasoline is readily available throughout the world, and it's a light fraction, so you get a lot of lift per volume of gasoline. And that's what we have. The, by the way, the zebra stripes there are, because remember, this is a balloon. Yes, it's a thin steel shell, very thin. But uh, it still has to have some, uh, you know, everything you add in the way of structure, it deducts from payload. It's just common in anything that flies. So the zebra stripes are transverse bulkheads. So if you have to push it with a boat or put some pressure on that very thin shell, that's where it's strongest. Uh, to get it to go down, uh, I'll give you a little bit on the, the theory of operation. To get it to go down, uh, you had ballast tank here on the bow and on the stern filled with air. When you tow out the dive site, you vent off that air, it's heavier than water, and you start down. Now it's very desirable to slow down and eventually stop and come back up. You have to get rid of weight. Well, you can't use air like a regular military submarine to blow uh, water out of ballast tanks because we're talking about back pressures up to 16,000 psi, and that's pretty tricky with air. So you have to drop mass weight. So right here and there are two ballast tubs. Each of those tubs is filled with eight tons of steel pellets. Essentially reusable sandblast, iron or steel, very ordinary stuff, no quality control. And so uh, we bought that stuff, and because of no quality control, we could have problems because at the bottom of those tubs is an opening right there and there. That white cylinder you see at the bottom is electromagnet. So when you energize that magnet, the shots magnetized can't fall. Here's where quality control comes in. Uh, you don't know what kind of steel you've got. Uh, some of it will take, uh, you know, it will uh, uh, become magnetized. That's not a good idea because you can't get away, rid of weight. So every pound of steel shot we used in this program for the three and a half years I was with it, we had a, a rig in the shop and we'd run all, every batch of uh, steel pellets through there, magnetize it, turn off the power, and if it flowed, then it was okay. If it didn't flow, out the back door. Okay, and uh, just in case you have a really bad emergency, you could drop both tubs. That'd be 16 tons plus the weight of these two tubs. That's the cabin. Uh, getting into the cabin, this is the water line here when you're on the surface. So where there's a tube, if you will, it goes down through the balloon here. The hatch is right there. The viewport's there. The whole, the whole thickness is about um, seven inches, and the viewport is about seven inches made out of acrylic plastic, a truncated cone. In other words, yeah. The inner surface was very small, almost one eyeball. The outer surface was several inches across. And, and, and since plastic does exactly that under pressure, it flows, then it's self-seating. So it's just a metal seat, no O-rings or anything. It would just adjust itself to the conical seat in the, uh, the uh, sphere itself. The sphere was built by the Krupp Works in Germany. Those of you up front can see the Krupp logo there. Little problem on a 16,000 foot dive at Guam, I'm getting ahead of my story a little bit, um, that um, when we bought the Trieste from the Picards in 1958 and uh, engaged Jacques Picard to be the, uh, a uh, consultant to us, show us how to maintain and operate it, it was only a 20,000 foot submersible and we wanted to go deeper. So we had to increase the size of the balloon to get more payload because Avgas, aviation gasoline, compressed by about 13 and percent. It's more compressible than seawater, so in the deep dive, we lost quite a bit of buoyancy just on that compression. Uh, also, we need a new cabin. No one uh, in the U.S. bid on the job. Uh, Krupp said we can do it, but we don't have the machines to forge two hemispheres. Because normally, in this kind of uh, construction, you start with 100% extra. So if you want a, an eight-ton sphere, you start with 16 tons of steel. And because most of the bad stuff on a forging is on the outer part, you machine all that off inclusions and so on, till you get down to sort of the core. Uh, they said, we don't know how to do that. Uh, we, we know how to do it, we don't have it. We, the, the Russians came and took away our machines after the war. And I understand they were on a barge that sunk in the Baltic, so the, those machines are on the floor of the Baltic somewhere. But we'll make it in three pieces. We know how to do this. So what you had was sort of two uh, semi-hemispherical end caps, one with a hatch in it, and the, other, the, op the opposing one with the uh, viewport in it. And as you, as you know, a rule of thumb is wherever you take out, um, say, 
five pounds of metal by machining, you sort of putty that around the opening. That's just a real rule of thumb. So there's a lot more mass in those two bits. Then there's a central ring, which was, uh, had no openings in it, so it was just a straight seven inches. It, was very, it had less mass than the two end caps. So we're making this dive off of Guam, and we get, uh, we're doing 16,000 feet. We're, we're, we're diving, the seawater temperature's about 84, and then you're going down to about, um, I think it was 34 degrees, roughly, at the seafloor, and you're soaking in that cold, so the, the, uh, the hull gets very cold. You come rock, rocketing back up to the surface. These two massive end pieces are expanding very slowly. The center one's expanding very fast because, folks, that thing was glued together with acrylic, very finely machined, as only the Germans might do, seat, and then with acrylic, smacked together. That's why you're seeing in this uh, diagram that there's no real bands on here sort of holding all the bits together. It's just all glued together. As I had one admiral who came, came to see us in San Diego, he said, well, I, how's this thing held together? I see a flange, you know, a typical way, two hemispheres, flange, bolts all the way around, O-rings, all that. He said, I don't see any of that. I said, well, uh, we don't have them, Admiral. He said, well, how's it fit together? I said, we, it's glued. And he said, Lieutenant, the Navy does not glue its ships together. <laughs> so I said, yes, sir. It's just like when my, when my wife, I get the last word in, yes, dear. Okay, so there it is. Uh, there's the cabin. Uh, that's how it works. Now let's, we will meet some of this later. As I said, we bought it in 1980. The Office of Naval Research purchased it. It was purchased as a research platform. So what Jacques and I did on the deep dive, we were the test pilots to prove out the platform to the maximum test of this, make sure it was safe, that it was reliable, and that it was efficient for a platform for ocean scientists. And only then would we put them in it. So it's like, you know, Boeing builds a new airplane. They don't roll it over to the terminal and load it with passengers. You do, you have test uh, flight protocols you go through, and once you sign it off, you hand it over to the mere mortals. So uh, our dive was not a scientific dive. It's proof of concept dive. And the people don't seem to understand that we didn't take a lot of data or we didn't stay on the bottom very long. It's like saying to Wilbur, well, you only flew a few feet and you only took one person. What, what use is this? I mean, you got to start somewhere. And so, uh, the Office of Naval Research uh, placed this at the Navy Laboratory in San Diego. So we have deep water nearby, as Patty Elkis knows, just off La Jolla and San Diego. You get down to 4,000 feet with a very short trip from the harbor. So that was a good place to uh, home port this thing. And I joined the program, as I said, as a submarine officer, serving a submarine in San Diego uh, in January of uh, 59. And the first dive in the U.S. Navy was made the month before, in December. And of course, uh, the, this cabin was my office. I've told you about it. Uh, arrayed around the window there uh, are all the hull penetrators for the various wires and controls and things that we needed to control from inside the sub uh, to topside uh, sensors and devices. It was pretty small as offices go. Um, <coughs> this is uh, one, this person's leaning up against the hatch right behind him. And this one is looking out through the viewport, and that's all the stuff. And we don't have actually the mission equipment. That's just the stuff we needed to run the uh, vehicle. The scientist would bring all of his own kit with him, and we'd integrate it, and uh, off we go. So uh, I think some of you, especially in the higher salary brackets here, um, probably have a 35 cubic foot refrigerator at home. Next time you reach in for a bottle of beer, think of two dudes working in there. And Picard, Picard was six feet two. Uh, Cousteau used to call him, not entirely affectionately, double maps, two meters. Um, and the temperature was about the same, but you were busy and you didn't really notice any sort of dress for the, for the, uh, the event. Uh, shortly after I got to the project, um, I was informed that uh, plans with ONR and with the Navy lab were to take it out to Guam and make a dive in the deepest place in the world ocean. And my response was probably the same as yours, was say what? <laughs> because the, this is, uh, well, let's call it March, around March of 59. I had uh, the previous November made a dive in the submarine that I was serving in in San Diego. 
uh, a World War II construction diesel submarine. We have what we call test depth. That's your maximum operating depth you're permitted to go without filling out a lot of forms. And it's 300 feet. So I made, we, we would do that a lot. Even when I had submarine command, uh, I always take my boat down quite frequently because it's better to find leaks while they're small. There are no surprises. So, and, and the crew is more relaxed going to the maximum possible depth if you do it a lot. And so, you know, everybody's better for it. So I've been to 300 feet. The following March, after I reported, January I reported to the Navy lab, the following March, March I made a dive in the Trieste to 4,000 feet. I thought, that's pretty good, you know, here I am, the bottom of the ocean, 4,000 feet. And, and our chief scientist said, Don, come on into the office. And I said, okay. He said, this is what we think we want to do. And that's when he got his say what, all in capital letters, exclamation point. Anyway, we started to tool up for our Challenger Deep that I told you earlier, bought a new cabin, expanded the balloon, increased the payload, got all our stuff packed up, went out to Guam. Because Mother Nature was pretty fortunate in terms of geography. We were only about 200 miles from the deepest place in the world ocean, Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. That had already been proved by the Brits, the Soviets, and Scripps, especially Scripps. Once they put the imprinter on it, then that was kosher. So we knew we were going to the right place. Most of them didn't think anybody was ever going to go there, but there we were. Uh, we could do it. Uh, we can only tow it at about five knots. So it was going to be a bit of a drama to get it out to the dive site in the Pacific Ocean, a lot of stuff peeling off because, you know, most of the operational equipment's on the outside, lights and cameras and batteries, things of this sort. But we were, you know, it looked like a go. We could do it, get out there and do that. So we went out to Guam, big Navy base there too. So we had a lot of support. And we set up our shop and, and started making increasingly deeper test dives. We started in the harbor about 200 feet. And uh, by November, I already told you about that dive, 16,000 feet. And uh, we stood down for uh, Christmas holidays, mostly to sort of get caught up with all of our repair bills and all of that and get it, get it ready for the, the final plunge. January of 96, 1960, early January, we made a dive to 24,000 feet. Everything was working good, so we were a go, and we went out and headed for the deepest place. This is kind of uh, fluff, but uh, there's Marianas Trench there. Um, and if you took Mount Everest and you dropped it in there, you could see you'd still have one, about a mile above Mount Everest if you drove over there. Just idea of how far below sea level you are here uh, compared to the height of Mount Everest. That really doesn't mean much. This is for the bridge clubs. I put that in there, so they like, wow, you know. You're engineers, so unimpressed by such stuff. <laughs> 23 January 1960, nine-hour dive. We, we, uh, it took us about five hours and some change to go down because we didn't know really what was under us. Where our mothership was a Navy destroyer escort, and we had a tugboat out from Guam that towed the Trieste out. And uh, we were on, those of you that remember, oh, there are a few gray hairs in here, and bald pates. Uh, remember Loran? And if you get on a baseline of Loran, your navigational information is really bad. It just, it's, um, it's, it's kind of like the, uh, in Playboy magazine, the damn page, the staples go right down through her tummy. Uh, and, and so this is, you know, on the baseline of Loran, you, uh, you are really, uh, uh, you don't know where you are. And uh, this destroyer we were on didn't have a depth sound. I mean, it had a depth sound to keep you from running into something, the you know, side of an island or a continent, Th maybe three or 400 feet under the keel. That's all you need for safe navigation. But we didn't have a uh, deep sea sounding device. Seven miles down, you're not going to find that. It's, so where are we? We can't navigate very well. We know approximately from scripts, the Soviets and the Brits, where it is, but uh, you know, seawater magnifies. You got to be more close than just waving your arm. Oh yeah, we get some sun lines, maybe a star at night, but it wasn't all that good. So what do we do? Well, innovation. It's a, the American gift. Innovation. We got several hundred blocks, one-pound blocks of TNT. Put a fuse <laughs> in them. You can't, you know, put a fuse in them, and uh, and then you light it, float it over the side. Now the hydrophone on the fathometer, the depth finder on the on the uh, on the destroyer is just fine. It can hear a lot of energy. So bang, it goes off as it uh, and the surface of the watch. Start your stopwatch. When you hear the return echo, then you just turn it off. Twelve seconds is deeper than six seconds. We don't know how, on an absolute basis how deep the ocean was, 
but we knew we were in the right place, and as long as they had the longest time return, that's pretty good. We finally mapped it out, about a mile wide, seven miles long, and then put the Trieste in the middle of that, made the dive, and it seemed to work, uh, because we did get the deepest place. Uh, you know, even Jim Cameron couldn't do that good. I've got him by 85 feet still. Uh, and uh, so down we went, five hours and some change going down, because again, you know, sea mounts, things like that. We don't know, outcrops didn't want to crash. So, and we got to the bottom, and uh, we were only, there were only 20 minutes. And uh, what happened is we landed, we stirred up the bottom sediment. And now that happens on every dive, but the subtle currents of the seafloor are moving away. By the time you've you know, kind of tidied up the cockpit and filled in your logs, call topside, tell them where you're at, uh, and get the cameras out, you're ready to go. In this case, it didn't. It was like being in a bowl of uh, milk. And, and after 20 minutes, that didn't diminish at all. We had to get back up. It's winter time, and I have so many hours in the day to hook up, unhook the tow from the tugboat. Got a 1,200 ton uh, seagoing tug here, and a human hand trying to hook the Trieste up in a sea state six. And so we want to allow a lot of time to do it safely. No use using a, losing a hand or a life just to do the dive. And same thing on the other end of the day, I wanted two good hours of sun, sunlight before we had to go in. So that kind of described how long our mission dive profile would be. So we got back up in a little over three hours. You don't worry now about outcrops and all that. We're just going straight up so we could dump a lot of weight and rock it back to the surface. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it was a good day's work. It was uh, nine hours. Uh, actually, the dive I made on the World War II battleship, Bismarck, uh, on one of the Russian Mir submersibles, that's 14 hours. Now, that's a drama. Uh, you know, you've, you've really got to plan your day, if you will, because they don't have uh, bathroom facilities. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, this is my first writing triumph. I wrote that cover story, and it's never gotten that good since. 52 years, and then, you know, I'm not a New Yorker, you know. The magazines that pay a lot of money. This one was pretty good. That's me there, that shock trying to figure out his how to inflate his life jacket. We, uh, <laughs> well, he was seasick, and uh, it was he was trying to avoid putting any large uh, objects into the the inflating pipe. Uh, anyway, a sea state was about eight when we got back up. I was pretty relieved to be back, and uh, the uh, we're sitting here. You know, you've had a We've had a, um, a bad dream, you wake up, and just for a fraction of a minute, you don't know if that's now or then. You know, then you realize, oh, I, I didn't fall off that building. Uh, and so we got back up, I, we climbed topside, and nobody's there. Now we're 200 miles from land. I'm sitting on a sort of a log, a sea state eight, and there's nobody there. Well, of course, immediately, I knew better. Our height of eye was so low that the ships were there, we just couldn't see them. Furthermore, I'd gone to the Air Force Base uh, the previous week and told them what we we're doing. They gave me an emergency beacon and they had their search and rescue aircraft orbiting the area. So it, it was fine, but it was just that little twitch, you know, the end of a perfect day. And, and Jacques and I were sitting there waiting to be picked up to go to, back to the mothership and uh, we we're, were discussing, well, when will somebody be here next? And we finally settled on two years. Well, we were wrong by a half century. It was 52 years later when Jim did it. That was another good day at the office. Um, they took us back to Washington. All the people remember the old saying about success has a, thousand, a million fathers, uh, whereas failure is an orphan. Well, once we did it, everybody was telling us how they had every confidence. and, and you know, We didn't get any cards and flowers from those dudes for the nine months we were on Guam. Everybody just hoped, just don't, when the hull broke, I didn't bother to tell uh, my, my masters in San Diego because they would just pull the plug on the whole operation. Uh, you remember Nelson's blind eye? You ever hear that saying that he was uh, in a formation attacking the, uh, the French ships and the lead admiral in, in another part of the formation had signaled uh, Nelson to get behind him. You know, they're all going to go like this. And uh, he held his telescope and his flag captain, Hardy, uh, said, well, Admiral, uh, admiral Nelson, you know, that signal says, um, you've got to get back here. And Nelson had one blind eye from a, a previous combat. I think it was in, in Denmark. Uh, so he's holding it to his blind eye, and he says, I don't see the signal, Hardy. <laughs> Proceed as I have ordered. Well, this was not Nelson's blind eye that I decided not to tell San Diego. It just, you know, the, the, 
they thought we were a bunch of young guys, they just left us alone, they didn't understand what we were doing, and I didn't pretend to add to that uh, lack of understanding, uh, that is, add knowledge to it. So, uh, but after we got back up, you know, in Washington, we were heroic, all the admirals and the captains, and uh, up on the hill, I had 150 American flags I took with me, handing them out like trading beads to the Indians. Appreciate your vote. I hope you'll take care of the Navy's undersea research program, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's what that flag is that the president's holding. Good day's work. We had one stowaway. Rolex had configured a special deep sea Rolex, uh, which rode on the outside. So the pressure at the seafloor was eight tons per square inch. They made five of them. Uh, the first two didn't make it. Uh, they tested them to 50,000 foot equivalent depth. But this one did, they call it the old lady. You can see how they got around the idea of the crystal by making this big acrylic wart on top. They now call it the old lady because uh, it, it, oh, they're very proud of that. I didn't know about it. Uh, uh, Picard, uh, when he, I went down to the cabin first, then he came down and he tied it off to one of the rungs in the ladder in the entrance tube. And then when we got back to the surface, he went up first and took it off. And if he'd asked about that, I would have never permitted it because, uh, uh, you know, this is a U.S. government operation. We don't endorse any private enterprise. In fact, National Geographic was irritated at me for a half century. That's why the, the Hubbard Medal came 50 years later. <laughs> they, they, they just, you know, they gave us a lunch when he got back to Washington with, to see the president and uh, a couple of warm handshakes and a lifetime subscription to the magazine shoved us out the back door. <laughs> so uh, uh, it took him a half century to get, get over this uh, and, and to award the medal because I think it was, it was one of the better things that happened that year. Uh, anyway, uh, and so I wouldn't even take their flag. That's how, uh, I don't know, religious I was about the whole thing. I figured, you know, I'm a government employee, a naval officer. The, the whole program belongs to the people of the United States, not to Rolex or National Geographic or whoever else. Uh, unlike some of the astronauts, they had golf balls and all kinds of things to the moon, but I just didn't think it was right. Well, they were in the Air Force. They were in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, you, if those of you in the Air Force realize the first thing they do is they build a golf course, then they go to Congress and say, well, we need money for the runways. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's, that, that's another story. Anyway. So uh, I didn't know about this until about two years later. I saw it on these comic strips. You know, they, uh, they used to have, in, in the, and maybe they still do, in comic strips, they use Science Today or something like, factual, but it's all little drawings. And uh, I saw something about the deepest diving watch. I look at this with some fascination because there was a little drawing that you asked, and a watch is the next frame. And I thought, Jesus, yeah, I didn't know about that. And, and I, I should have guessed it. I'm pretty naive because the uh, few months after we made the deep dive, a package comes to me, and it's a Rolex watch. And, and they just simply said, came from Switzerland, they said, uh, uh, Mr. Picard suggested you ought to have one of our watches. Oh, that's pretty nice. So uh, I you know, didn't think about it anymore. And uh, so that was, you know, it's a good story that they built a special watch to stand all that pressure uh, it, it gives some idea of their engineering, their excellence in testing, and blah, blah, blah. It's pretty good branding. Uh, and yet, if that's such a good story, why wasn't it in Picard's book, Seven Miles Down? He didn't put it in there. And uh, he said nothing about it. And so uh, it clearly was, he knew he was doing wrong. And besides, it was just a consultant to us. He had no ownership stake in the thing. I, you know, he's a dear friend. Uh, he's deceased now. He died on November 8th. But he made a mistake there and, uh, and could have got me in a lot of trouble if it become general knowledge because, you know, you, you know, you're the captain of the ship and you run aground, whether you're in your cabin or whatever, you're going to get some on you. It's just not good. Okay, well, that's a long story of that thing, but let's move ahead here. Um, 1963, the Trieste was retired at age of 10. It was beat up. It's a flying machine. Its days were ended. It's in the Navy Museum in Washington, D.C. If you're ever in Washington, D.C., go down to the Washington Navy Yard. A cab will take you there. Best way to do it, get through the gate. And uh, it's a wonderful museum. The trests all put back together, uh, looking a lot better than this, but the same kind of coloration uh, way in the back. And there's some nice descriptive stuff in the back. 
Another Trieste was built here at Mare Island, San Francisco Bay Naval Shipyard, Trieste Roman numeral two, Trieste two, and that was operated until 1984. So for uh, 26 years, the only way you could get scientists into the deepest part of the oceans was either with the Trieste or the French Navy's uh, bathyscaphe Archimedes or Archimed. Uh, they're all replaced then by 20,000 foot submersibles. Why is 20,000 feet uh, important? Well, it's because if you look at a, a chart of seafloor area versus depth, you find that at 20,000 feet, you can look at 98% of the seafloor in the world ocean. So that's roughly a little more than half the maximum depth in the ocean. So cost benefit, huh? You build a submersible, I design it for that depth, and you can get 98% of the seafloor. That last 2% uh, is between 20,000 feet and 36,000 feet. Having said that, that last 2%, as I said last week in Shanghai, that's equivalent to the area of China. So it's worth exploring. Those are the deep trenches. If we understand the fundamental sort of plate tectonics of the ocean floor, you've got uh, spreading centers where new seafloor is being created. 200 million years later, it's disappearing into the deep trenches, the subduction zone. We don't know much about the subduction zones. The spreading center has been studied a lot because there's mineral resources there, high, you know, the smokers, the, uh, the hydrothermal vents. I, did, I dove on those uh, off the Azores, and your water depth's about 9,000 feet there. It's not bad, very interesting, seeing this whole life form. It's like visiting another planet. That life form doesn't even know about the sun. It's getting all of its energy from the, uh, from the interior of the Earth, thermal energy from the interior of the Earth. Were you diving with Robert Powell? No, I, was, I know Bob, but no, this was uh, actually we're hauling tourists. This, uh, we're working with a company called Deep Ocean Expeditions, and uh, we could take you to the Titanic, took over 80 people there, about two dozen to the Bismarck, and nearly 100 to our hydrothermal vents uh, in the Atlantic and off the uh, uh, East Pacific rise. Uh, no, Bob wasn't with us on that one, but it's really fascinating. And usually halfway through these dives, we sit down in some nice site, get out our Russian box lunches, have lunch, and then resume the dive. But, Titanic's a 12-hour dive, so it's hour six. We land on the bridge of the Titanic. Captain Smith was last seen, get on our turn-on yellow submarine on the, the player and have our sandwiches. And, and same thing with Bismarck, 14-hour dive, seven hours we land not far from where Hitler visited. You've got pictures of Hitler going aboard in the Baltic. Um, and uh, in the hydrothermal vents, sit right next to one of these smokers, you know, watch all of the animal life. It really is, you, you, like you've been on a spaceship because you come from this photosynthetic world that we know up here down to this place in you know, pitch blackness. And then you come in there, turn on the lights, and here's, you know, just like visiting a great big party going on the shrimps, and there's the crabs that are catching the shrimps that get in the hot water and become scampi, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> it's, it's great. Anyway, I diverge. Uh, uh, so that's pretty good, but that's, it, I think you're getting the point. It's, that's not an argument not to have some deep deep probes. Now, in my view, the heavy lifting is going to be done by uh, manned and unmanned vehicles, AUVs, ROVs. But there will always be room for manned, manned submersibles, for several reasons, from sort of the um, imprecise because, you know, like you tell your kids, why can't I do that? Because. Uh, to uh, the advantage of having the trained mind and the trained eyes in there at, in certain areas. Because, yeah, okay, you say, well, the ROV's got the trained mind and eye there, it's just through an umbilical TV camera. Yeah, but this is the view. You've all done uh, 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 scuba diving or uh, snorkeling, your face mask. You don't have peripheral vision. And there's, there's a lot to be said for that uh, in, in just having the human there. But, but more so, when we put the first lunar lander up and brought back some samples from the moon, I didn't go out on my deck and look up there and say, well done. But when Buzz and uh, Neil were up, uh, I went out and I said, there's two of me up there. I can connect with that. And don't ever disallow that because the money valve is not in your offices. It's on Capitol Hill that directs money to things we want to do. And it's the, it's the public, an ocean aware public, that will insist that we make national investments there. Very nice to go to Mars. I hope I'm not offending anybody. But it's like Nero, Roman's burning. Here we are looking at Mars and the water's coming up around our ankles. There are some real things we have to do on this manned satellite we all live on called uh, uh, planet Earth. 
So we, um, in, in um, getting man under the sea, there's that kind of thing you can't quantify, but you can say it's pretty important. I, Jim said it succinctly uh, last year, just after his time. He said, what kid wants to grow up to be a robot? Well, okay, you know, to get involved in this stuff. Designing, building robots. I'm not offending anybody, I hope. But also personal participation, pretty important. Not all of us, that's for sure. But it's still important. People like us doing these things. Okay. Uh, then this is just a catalog of some of the 6,000 meter or 20,000 foot submersibles. The first was the Navy's Alvin. That was upgraded from 6,000 foot submersible to 20,000 feet. It's retired. It's a woods hole now. Next, France came along with the Nautil. Still operational, uses a, uh, a titanium uh, pressure hull. The uh, Russians, the Mir-1 and Mir-2, as you probably know, Mir is the Russian word for peace. Uh, plus their navy has the Rus and the Consul. And I might, I've made quite a few dives in the Mirs. They're very good subs. Actually, it was built in Finland uh, because the uh, Soviet shipyards uh, were too busy building warships, so they just jobbed out, as they did with their research at ships and so on. Most were being built in Eastern Europe or Finland, and so the two mirrors were built in Finland uh, by a company lo no longer in business. I don't know if there's a cause and effect there or not. Uh, Japan came in a bit later with their Shinkai 6,500 meters, so that's 21,000 feet. So now Japan had the deepest diving man submersible in the whole world. And I, uh, a few years before that, I taught the Japanese uh, through my consulting company how to drive submersibles. So I have kind of a paternal relationship with this project. And now, of course, we've got China. That's the money shot. You probably recall 2007, the Russians, using the mirrors, put a Russian flag at the real North Pole. Uh, there's a story behind that. I won't go into it. But they didn't pay for it. They didn't plan it. They just hijacked it. But uh, they took all the credit for it. So that's what we call the money shot. That's the bow of the Titanic is another money shot. And here's the sub. 7,000 meters. Now China has the deepest diving man submersible in the world, Jiaolong. And uh, I've been consulting with them. Uh, it was built there by their ship research center. It's like our David Taylor uh, Center in the United States. Ship design, ship machinery, and so on. Tow tanks. But they got the job from their government to design and build and test and operate this sub. Uh, and it's very nicely done. First manned submersible ever built in China. And they pretty much got it right, but it took them 12 years. They, they, they did a nice conservative uh, job of evolving and developing this thing. And it's, it's operating very well now in support of their interests, their government's interest in ocean mining. Okay, four, plan, uh, four programs right now, they're doing the deep diving thing. Of course, you've, you've uh, all aware of Jim's program. I was on his expedition last year. Did a smart thing. Look at the, the you know the direction that these this submersible is going. It's vertical, isn't it? Not horizontally, but all the submersibles I've shown you are oriented horizontally. So when you're going down, you you've got you know some resist hydrodynamically, not the best shape. He uses a spar buoy. That's the direction of travel. This is a very efficient diving shape. The water line on this thing is about right there when it's on the surface. Heaps of batteries in here, lithium cell batteries, 12 thrusters. The actual spherical cabin is right there. Then there are arms that poke out with TV cameras and lights. As you can imagine, Jim had the best of cameras on there. Best of, doing shooting 3D, by the way. And then, <laughs> but same thing, you get to the seafloor and you want to come back up. These are steel weights that he can shuck off and the sub comes back up. When he made his dive in uh, uh, April of last year, he got to the seafloor, I think it was in 90 minutes, and he got back up in 70 minutes, and he spent two or three hours on the seafloor. It's a very efficient way of doing things. Here they had two subs uh, in, uh, in scale. His on the right, of course, and mine to the left. Uh, and I had the good opportunity to be the last person to see him before he dove, and the first person we came up, that's uh, Susie, his wife there. Uh, and all I said was, good luck and have fun. And we came back up, I said, welcome to the club. So there's just two of us in the world now, it's myself and Jim. Uh, but it was nice, you know, half century. I never thought I'd see this again. So it was quite an honor to be part of his program. Actually, I'd signed a non-disclosure agreement with him in uh, 93, when he first started this project. But he didn't tell me much over those years. And it was only until 
the beginning of last year that I got heavily involved in this program. So there you see it floating vertically in its normal operating uh, position. Uh, Zodiac boat up there, divers. They put it in the water with salvage bags. These are infl inflatable balloons, if you will, that are hooked to the side to, because uh, it's launched horizontally, then it erects into the vertical position. There's the viewport that he's got, the two cameras and light uh, booms sticking out, and then they cut these free, and the sub starts down. Uh, those were not stowaways. Uh, uh, Rolex decided, well, you know, half century later, let's demonstrate consistency, engineering excellence, design, blah, blah, blah. And look at what they've did. I think this is remarkable. Flat crystal. The, the, the pressure on that thing, eight tons per square inch. And they tested it at 50,000 feet. They made five of them. All five passed. All five went to Guam with Jim. And there it is on the wrist. That's his manipulator. There's the watch right there on the wrist of the manipulator. And uh, National Geographic and Rolex were the two sponsors, I think. <laughs> they may have been in for about 30 million, I'm not sure. The sub made 16 dives, so the unit cost per dive is, uh, uh, brings tears to your eyes. And there we are comparing. They brought one of the old ladies out to Guam, so I've got the replica of the old lady here, model of mine. There's his in the shipping position uh, horizontally, and there's his new watch. Uh, and they're being launched. You can see the uh, salvage bags, the pillows here, that help it float. And then they cut these loose, and then it erects into the vertical position. Uh, he gave it to Woods Hole. Uh, I don't believe it's going to uh, operate again. They keep claiming that, well, he gave them an endowment of a million dollars. But Woods Hole risk management people aren't going to let any of their scientists dive in this thing. Because in my view, with all due respect, Chris, I think one person subs our dead end line of evolution. You know, multitasking, we all know, is, doesn't work so good. There have been psychological, uh, uh, psychiatric studies where it shows it's about, if you try multitask, the, your efficiency goes down between 20 and 30 percent, uh, you know, uh, both things you're trying to do. Um, and so uh, to fly these things is a full time job and to be a scientist, full time job. And if you take one of these things and you kit it out with all kinds of remote instrumentation, Sampler, so the pilot only has to fly. What have you got? You got an AUV with a man in it. So where's the gain? Uh, I, I don't see it. Maybe Chris will be able to convince me someday. Uh, and here he is, folks. <laughs> Hold your applause. Uh, Richard Branson and Chris got together. Uh, Chris actually bought the sub and then talked Richard into joining him. Uh, uh, that's before the divorce. Uh, and then uh, this is basically a flying, underwater flying machine. Uh, Graham Hawks, an inventor uh, up in Richmond, California, came up with this original concept of a deep flight. Uh, my Japanese friends call it deep fright, and I don't know if that's a, if that's a just a speech uh, impediment or is Freudian. I haven't quite figured that out, but anyway, there it is, flying underwater. Uh, this is pretty much what it will look like. Uh, another drawing of it. The uh, the pilot lies down. This is the axis of the cabin itself. So it's a cylinder with a transparent dome on this end and a solid dome on the other. Batteries and all the other stuff in the back here, propellers, flight controls, and so on. And you can see Chris is a very large person. And so when he uh, gets into that thing, they have to take a slight vacuum to pull him into the <laughs> tube and then pressurize it. He reminds me of those things in the circus, the, in the cannon. You fire the guy out. So uh, we, we strap him down so they pressurize the inside to get him out. Uh, he doesn't go too far. Uh, there's another company in Florida, Vero Beach, Florida, called Triton, and they're going to uh, go with a glass pressure hull. And there's a company uh, in uh, San Diego area called Rayotech that has figured out a scheme that you can use glass and keep it from being scratched because, as we all know, any scratch on glass is a stress concentrator, and that's not a good idea. It, whereas with acrylic, you can sandpaper it and gouge it with a knife and you're not going to compromise its integrity. You may not be able to see too well, but it's not going to be weakened. But you scratch glass, immediately you've got a stress concentrator and a real problem. Uh, gra glass, of course, gets stronger with depth. So there's a lot to be said for it. Theory and practice, folks, my first remark when I started out. Laboratory curiosity, apparently Rayotech, the company down in San Diego area, figured out a way that you can do it that'll work. So stay tuned. Uh, I was told a month ago that uh, uh, the Triton uh, submarine, uh, submarine company 
has gotten initial funding. So they're uh, moving ahead with this. And finally, the fourth one is China. Uh, they call this the Ocean Challenger. Could be probably 2020. They're trying to get into the next five-year plan. And this will be a 11,000 meter submersible. Here are the specs, nothing particularly different. Two people, except that's not three, but two. Uh, weight and so on. That's really not worth focusing on. So there it is. That's the mantra of the day. Taking the trained mind and the trained eyes into the great depths. However, there have been unmanned vehicles that have been down the Challenger Deep, the deepest place in the ocean. The first was Kaiko, a Japanese word for trench. It went down in 1995 and 1998. Uh, quite successful, regrettably, on a shallower dive on the slopes of uh, the Japan Trench, the uh, umbilical came up at, with no vehicle on the other end. Uh, it somehow got away. Now, all of these vehicles are kitted out with strobe lights, acoustic beacons, radio beacons, everything you can think of, and bright yellow paint. No one's ever found it. My theory is that there's a, a fishing village on the coast of China, and the head man has this most interesting <laughs> coffee table. That's why he's head man. He's got something nobody else has got. And it makes very agreeable noises and lights, you know, kind of discotheque sort of thing. Because uh, I don't, it would have floated, and it would have floated somewhere. No one's ever seen it. What if Godzilla did? Huh? What if Godzilla Well, God, Godzilla may, may have done that. Maybe we can get one of the puppies. <laughs> if it made it with it. Uh, the thing here is that um, uh, they, that was a 14 kilometer fiber octave tether. Very expensive, very exotic to build. In fact, they had to build two of them. The first one, they didn't quite uh, get it finished. It was flawed. And so they just re-terminated. So it's about a, oh, I think it's maybe a 26,000 foot submersible now. It can't go the full depth because they had to chop off part of it. They built a new vehicle, that's a $17 million uh, problem. Now, the next and the last one was uh, Woods Hole, where they, the uh, HRO, hybrid ROV. It can be an ROV tethered, or it can be an AUV uh, un untethered. And so at the lower right-hand uh, side, you see the, fi see the final version of the Nereus, which is what they call it. And I think it was 2009 that it dove to the Challenger Deep. Uh, and it seems to be a pretty good vehicle. Right now, it's working off uh, Eric Schmidt's ship, Falcor, in the Caribbean. Uh, so it, it, it's being kept busy. I don't know if they're going to go back to Challenger Deep if and when. I, that's something that I'm not on their mailing list. And that's it, folks. I came out right on an hour because we started five minutes late. You may be thinking, Jesus, this guy never comes up for air. <laughs> I, I, give you back, I give you back one minute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don, for coming. And maybe we can take a couple of questions for those who can stay. Yeah, don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not put off by people getting up and walking out. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm quite used to it. I did a high school in Tyler, Texas once, and I asked the principal how long, he told me, and I said, okay, I, I'll stick right on that. It's like salami, you know, you just slice off as much as you, they need. But about halfway through it, a lot of bells rang, and my whole audience got up and walked out. It was the end of the school day. They had their priorities. That's why they're in Texas. Yes, sir. Is it, is it an incremental challenge to go from 20,000 to 35,000 feet uh, engineering-wise, or is there, some, is there something that comes up at like 25,000 feet that requires a whole different approach? It, his question was, is it an incremental challenge to go, say, from 25,000 to 35, 36,000 feet? My view, no. Uh, I asked Woods Hole about that when they're upgrading Alvin. As you may know, Alvin's being upgraded from 14,500 feet, something like that, to uh, oh, about 24,000 feet. It'll be the second large, uh, deepest diving man submersible. Thing is, they got Lockheed Martin involved, and all the money got spent. So what you've got now is you've got a 24,000-foot uh, cabin and a 14,000-foot sub because all the peripherals, because you have other pressure vessels in there for the batteries and controllers and things like that. And they couldn't upgrade the whole sub. And probably syntactic foam, I don't know. But anyway, they spent the whole 25 million or whatever it was uh, and never got the thing finished. I suspect some year they'll do that. Uh, but I asked them about this, well, why not just go the full depth? I mean, you don't have to do it every day, but if, if you want to go into the deep trenches, you got the capability. Because most of the deep trenches you know, are sort of between 
28 and 36,000 feet. There's not that much difference between the, the deep places and the ocean. Um, and that'd be an awfully nice uh, capability to have. And they said, well, you know, a lot of ho, ho and hum about technical and we can't. I listened to what they said. I still can't uh, see the difference. Your, you know, your, your problem is pressure. You've got to make a robust uh, hull. Uh, you've got to have electric power, whether it's for 25,000 or 36,000 feet. You want as much as you can get. Um, and, you know, with these new uh, batteries that are coming out, again, that's the march of material science. Uh, you can do that. So they're, they're sort of, that's, that's constant. The only uh, delta I can see is the thickness of the hull in titanium or something like that. I don't understand it. So I say no. There's no real difference. It would be cost difference. And of course, every one of these has to have a mothership. It's even better if you have a dedicated mothership. Uh, the two mirrors have uh, a ship called the Keldish, and that's all it does. Basically, Atlantis, they claim it's an oceanographic ship, but it's pretty much dedicated to Alvin. By the way, they're in San Francisco now, or maybe San Diego. I, they, 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 before they did the sea trial on the new hull, they just sent it all out here. And they were in Astoria, and then they were supposed to be in San Francisco, and then they're going down to San Diego. And sometime along the west coast here, they'll do their actual acceptance trials. Uh, Alvin's owned by the Navy, so they have some pretty high standards about what they have to do. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked a bit about the uh, going down to the you know, plumes and stuff like that, and all the uh, life forms and you know all the stuff activity happening there, and, and the, the uh, minerals and stuff like that that make it worthwhile. What about going into the trenches? Is it, what, what do you see down there, and what is it that's so interesting about going to those depths? You know, it's not going to be a very satisfying an uh, answer, and that is, it's what we don't know. It's why we go. I, uh, Jim uh, made a very successful dive in the Bismarck Trench near Papua New Guinea, at Papua New Guinea, about 27,000 feet. That's when he lifted the embargo on the design of his sub and what they were going to do with it. He won a lot of press piling in on him. There were only 30 people in his project. Uh, also, the embarrassment. When you're a very high vis visibility person and you, you fail at something, everybody says, oh, you see Hollywood guy showboating and try to buy his way into the blah, blah, blah. That's, of course, not true in Jim's case. Nevertheless, at that dive, he brought up quite a bit of bottom sediments from that trench. And we had a staff of, um, I believe, 13 scientists aboard, mostly from Scripps. We had another ship with us, inappropriately called Barracuda. It should have been uh, <laughs> the gummy bear or something like that. It was pretty bad. Uh, and, and so we had biologists, benthic biologists, geologists, and so on with us. And they were really excited about getting this, uh, these sediment samples of microbes they're finding there, new stuff that we didn't know about, and really keen to go back to the deep, deepest trenches and do more of this work. Um, as far as large critters are concerned, probably not, because the further you get from land, the more sterile the ocean gets. It's because of lack of nutrients. Most of the nutrients are being flushed, organic, inorganic nutrients, from land, so the coastal zone uh, continental shelf is where you really you know, hit pay dirt and then a little bit over the, say, the continental uh, 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 crest down in the deep ocean, slope into the deep ocean. Uh, so 200 miles off land, uh, not so great. It's sort of a desert. There's life everywhere. I mean, you get all the, uh, um, um, the invertebrates, the shrimps, the jellies, things like that, and bioluminescence when you got the lights turned out, things sparkling away, but sort of compared to what you see in the coastal oceans, not much. Um, there is, as you probably know, they, they did some really wonderful photography of the giant squid recently from a submersible. Really good stuff. But just when you think you've seen it all, when you've seen the movie, uh, they've determined that there is a colossal squid uh, because they've seen some of these uh, bits of these things drift up on beaches. They haven't seen one in situ. The, the wonderful imagery they got recently of the giant squid was in situ and they put out bait from the submersible and it came in and took and got comfortable with the lights and was just hanging around. It was really something. So uh, I think more, uh, uh, probably a lot of the discoveries will be in sort of the microbiology and microplankton area and what's contained in those sediments. Regrettably on Jim's dive in the Challenger Deep, um, and it's Murphy's Law. The, um, he had just started to pick up samples, sediment. He had core tubes, so he could 
push them into the bottom, bring them up. Then he had a little uh, cupboard where he could uh, sequester them because as you come back up, you got a lot of turbulence around the sub and just flush it all out. So you lose your sample. So that was all designed into that to protect this stuff. And he was just reaching out for another one and one of the hydraulic hoses broke. Now, you know, arthritis sets in, the manipulator's here. He can't shut the door to the, the cupboard, if you will, and uh, he can't take samples. And it was, a, you know, it was a $50 hose that screwed up a billion dollar project. You see it all time in the space program. Standard stuff, pressure tested, specif uh, 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 qualified by the vendor, and tested again by Jim and his team. Just a simple hydraulic hose, and that crippled that mission. Then, uh, due to programming errors, he had 12 thrusters, and uh, 11 of them shut down. So all he could do was circle, make circles on the seafloor, and that was it. So it was not a very productive dive, but the one in the Bismarck Trench uh, was very productive. And the, uh, what was his name? Uh, Wake Up. Uh, <laughs> the guy at Scripps, the, that's the... Uh, Doug? Doug Bartlett. Doug Bartlett, thank you, yeah. Doug's doing some good work, and some of his papers will be out soon. Uh, and we, we do hope to go back, if not with man system, unmanned system. We, the ocean community, not me. Okay. I don't know if that's a good answer, but the, the, you know, the, the top answer is we go there because we don't know what we'll find. That's the nature of exploration. I, I define exploration as curiosity acted upon. We're all curious about stuff we run into all the time. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder how that works. But if you don't follow up on it, find out how it works, why it works, then you're not an explorer. Uh, I think you know, little kids are explorers. We're all genetically programmed that way. You see them in the mother's arms looking around. When they're big enough to run around, they're taking the gum off the bottom of the table in a restaurant. And they're exploring that way. Uh, but somehow the uh, hormones and peer pressures in the, in the teens beat it out of most of us. And a lot of us don't persist as explorers till our uh, you know, adult years. See, I don't use the term explorer as climbing the highest or going, diving to the deepest. It's curious people learning how things work on our planet. And even if you're not a scientist, it's so important to be curious about the world around you. Yes, sir? What do you see as interesting developments in the next 10 or 25 years? The next 10 or 25 years, interesting developments? Well, I, I think what we're going to see is the development of uh, um, sort of the subject what I've been talking about is a man-submersible system. We can't look at these things as, as individual units. It's a whole system. That's the mothership. Uh, you should have an ROV along that has the same depth capability, so if the sub gets in trouble, you've got onboard assistance. Uh, the model that appeals to me is the deep sea drilling project, where a special, uh, specially configured drilling ship is doing these very deep geological cores all over the world ocean, world ocean drilling uh, uh, program. And uh, that, uh, that ship is, was built by the United States, operated by the National Science Foundation, but we sell tickets to any, any uh, investigator that wants to use it. So uh, even during the Cold War, we had Soviet sci geoscientists out on the, on the ship uh, uh, because they could buy certain legs. The, you, you publish the ship's schedule uh, a year or two in advance, and then uh, if that's an area where you really want to work, you, you apply to get time on that ship. I can see that model for uh, a, a Full ocean depth, submersible system. Of course, you can do anything less than that, but it would be a liveaboard um, mothership, an ROV system, and other uh, uh, required scientific instrumentation, and it would be available as an international asset. I don't think you need more than a couple systems of that sort to do the trenches. You don't have to have you know one every uh, country has to own it, just like the deep sea drilling ships. Pretty much that one system was uh, the only one for. 90% of the life of this program. Now, Japan has one called Chikyu, and the Russians keep promising to build one, but it never seems to happen. Uh, so it, it, there's at least two in the world now. So I see that, yes, sir? India has one. India has one? India has one. I, uh, well, it probably ran aground somewhere. Nope. Beautiful, Finn Cantieri built it, so there's three. Is that right? Okay, three of them, India. Uh, and uh, with respect to uh, investigating the deep trenches, the thing we're not doing now, I still think there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, well, heavy lifting is going to be done by unmanned vehicles. Now, this, the problem here is that if we agree that about 90% of the world ocean is unexplored in terms of having pretty complete knowledge of this environment, 
that's a big job left to do. Uh, there is not enough money in all the treasuries of the world to build fleets of research ships that can undertake that 90% of the world ocean. And even if you could build that many ships, there's not enough universities in the world that you could populate them with scientists, trained scientists. So how do we get around that? And I think AUVs are the way to autonomous unmanned vehicles, machines that can do dumb science. That is, where you don't require a human presence. You save the ships for the kind of work that requires human presence at the work site. And so I think that uh, AUVs that can be programmed to do uh, surveys, data taking, over long periods of time, autonomously, we're talking months maybe, on a mission, coming up, transmitting data, satellite back down, you could probably do that. Uh, in fact, uh, one of Eric Schmidt's companies, Hadel, Rick Rakowski there, has actually calculated how many AUVs he feels can do the world ocean, that 90%. That's pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? Uh, that these little satellites all over the world ocean are gathering this data. Because we can, we can handle the data. A modern computational system can handle it. It's just actually getting those numbers and bringing them in. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting, next 10 to 20 years. Chris, can you briefly say, briefly say what you see in the next 10 to 20 years? Well, I mean, hopefully our project is going to open up. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so he's doing. Tell us what you're doing, Chris. Well, you, you saw this stuff. But the, the one thing I think we bring to the table that's unusual is uh, 20 kilometers of range on the seafloor once we get down there. So that's a, a lot more exploration than, than we've been capable of doing. Um, beyond that, though, I would agree with Don that the autonomous and ROV world is where it's going to be um, because of the dollars. You can do so much more uh, with AUVs. And as AUVs get, get much, much better, it's, it's you know, the one thing, I mean, we haven't really talked about it, but uh, satellites, drones, all that, you have full satellite communication, instantaneous, you know, high bandwidth. Down there, like full ocean depth, you're talking sub 2,000 uh, bandwidth, it's nothing. So your text messaging, you know, your controls to your AUV, and you're not getting back video, you're not getting back pictures. So it's a much more challenging AUV problem than a drone, because you can't jump in and, and repurpose it immediately and, and do things you'd like to do. Uh, and that's not that the physics of that are not going to get better, and the um, the uh, fiber optic links are as complicated in them in and of themselves as the AUV. So, you know, do you want to try and have a fiber optic link on that? I don't know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, so you know, having an AUV that's really bright is 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 the key. 